so far, we've talked about all the different groups of primates and where they live. So now we're going to talk about food. I love food, and so does pretty much every other primate out there. Here we have a variety of primates and what they eat. Take a moment. Do you know what groups of primates these are? So we have a couple different diets displayed here. We have meat eating, fruit eating, leaf eating, and also uh, gum eating. So this little pygmy marmoset, um, they bite into the tree and they eat the sap that comes out. Well, let's start with the most common diet, frugivory. This is just a fancy word that means you eat fruit. Uh, fruit are interesting because they are patchy in both time and space. So fruit are not available year round. So you need to be able to find the fruit when they're available and do something else when they're not. They're also patchy in space because not all trees make fruit that is edible. Um, the good thing though is they are easy to digest and pretty much all primates do show a preference for fruit when it is available. Um, and in fruit, we have high carbs, but low protein. So if you eat a lot of fruit, you will need to supplement your diet with something else to make sure you get enough protein. So that's why if you're a human and you're a vegetarian who only wants to eat fruit, you're going to need to add a little something else. Um, so here we can see our bonobo eating some fruit. We also have a red colobus high up in the tree grabbing some. Um, and here we have an orangutan who really loves his bananas. Uh, this is an adult male. You can tell because of the developed cheek flanges on his face. Next up, we have gramnivory or eating seeds. Here we have a capuchin using a big old rock to see if he can crack open that nut. Um, they are tougher to process, so they are a little bit harder and more work intensive. Um, but in contrast to our fruit, they are available most of the year, and that is a decided benefit. Next, we have nectivory. So this means you eat flowers and or the nectar of the fruit. Again, like um, nectar of the plant, again, like fruit, they are patchy in both time and space for similar reasons. And frequently, flowers are shorter lived than the fruit them themselves. We also have filivory, or eating the leaves and stems of plants. Um, these actually have a fair amount of protein, um, but they don't have many carbs. Um, they are abundant, they're available year round, though um, some primates do have a preference for specific types of leaves and those will not be as um, abundant equally throughout the year. Um, they are very hard to digest, so many dedicated leaf eaters have specialized adaptations to make sure that they can eat these leaves. Um, so here we have a black and white colobus. We, here we have a cute little gorilla eating a leaf. Next up, we have our gumnivory. So these are eating exudates, the gum and sap of trees. Um, so they are available year round, um, but you do need to have specialized feeding adaptations. So here is a pygmy marmoset. The two little lumps are their babies, <laughs> which is really cute. Um, so what they do is they bite onto these trees and they actually create ga these essentially gaping wounds on the trees. So they um, expel some of that sap. Um, these guys are really interesting because they find a tree and they make it their territory and they defend it. So other pygmy marmoset family groups um, cannot access that tree. They will fight each other off. Next, we have faunivory or eating other animals. Um, so this could be invertebrates or vertebrates. Um, they are a really good source of energy, especially protein, but you have to catch them first. Um, so here we have a picture of a tarsier, um, actually right next to an owl. So you can see that they are, are convergent with owls there. On the top, they're eating a grasshopper. Um, but you will also occasionally see tarsiers eating lizards or even small birds. Um, on the bottom there, you see a chimpanzee eating a red colobus. That is one of their favorite snacks. Um, there's a couple other things that you'll see primates eating, so like tubers, roots, and bulbs. Um, they do require some work, though. These you're going to need to dig up. Um, a lot of them are kind of hard to digest, um, and a few of them will eat grass. Our gel gelatas eat grass, and um, orangutans will eat bark when fruit are not available. Um, so after thinking about all these diets, we can actually classify primates into different um, dietary types. Um, so we, what we will do is we'll try to figure out what's the most prominent food source, and that's how we will categorize a, po a population. There is a lot of variation. It will vary, vary across different populations, vary within a year, um, and fulivores commonly do supplement with fruit. So what we're trying to do is figure out what is the most common across all of these different variables. Um, 
The reason we do this is it's very helpful for understanding evolutionary trends and to see if there is any uniting factor within a particular group of primates. So let's look at an example. Here we have a bush baby, spider monkey, langur, and rhesus macaque. These are colored to show the approximate percentages of, the, of what they eat. Um, so you can see with our spider monkey, they eat a lot of fruit and they are more frugivorous than any of the uh, others here. So we would call this spider monkey a frugivore. The first one is our bush baby. The biggest one there is insects and they eat a fair amount of insects. So we would call them an insectivore or a faunivore. Our langur, um, now they eat a bunch of leaves. So we would call them a folivore. And a rhesus macaque, primarily eats herbs, which that would also be a folivore. The reason why we care about this is diet influences pretty much everything about a species. It's the size of your group, the social dynamics within that group, the arranging patterns, body size, activity, the morphology of your gut and teeth, how you move, your life history, brain size, really everything um, boils down to the effect of the food that you eat. Food is everything. One of the reasons we like to think of this is allometry. Allometry is the study of changes in body size and its consequences. Basically, size matters. The reason why we talk about allometry here is the, how big you are or how small you are influences the size of other things and your metabolism. So as an animal gets larger, they need more food, but an absolute no, number of more food, but they need relatively less energy because the metabolism curve is a little bit strange. And it also means they can actually more easily digest foods because naturally their digestive tract is longer, so there's more of a chance to absorb more nutrients from that food. Um, small animals, they need absolutely less food, but it needs to be high quality. Um, these large animals, they can actually get away with more low quality food. So you can think of it like this, a bigger primate has a bigger gut and a longer retention time in that gut without changing anything else. So they have increased digestibility just because they are bigger. Um, so what we see is when we're looking at classifying different types of diets, folivores, um, they're highly abundant, but the food is pretty low quality. So you need to be big. You need to be a big animal to have this be um, a viable solution for you. Insectivores, they're high quality, but they're hard to hard to find, hard to obtain. It's a lot of work. So they tend to be small because it needs to be worth the effort. They only need to catch so many insects. Imagine if a gorilla only ate insects, it would take them forever to catch them all. Um, frugivores, this really depends on where they get their protein because um, frugivores have to supplement their diet with something to get enough protein. So if they're larger, they will tend to supplement their diet with fruit they're smaller, they would tend to supplement their diet with insects. Here's a really nice graph to show you the uh, size of species, species on the x-axis, and then the number of species with different diets on the y-axis. Um, there's an interesting thing um, called K's threshold of about 500 grams. If you're smaller than 500 grams, you basically have to be an insectivore because you need to be able to get high quality protein. Um, if you're larger than 500 grams, that's when we start to see um, different types of diets emerge. So maybe you'll be, eat insects and fruit. Um, what you can see here on the bottom one is we have frugivores, but we're split between frugivores that supplement their diet with insects versus supplementing their diet with leaves. The smaller ones tend to supplement their diet with fruit, with insects, and the larger ones tend to supplement their diet with leaves following um, the predictions that we that we already discussed. As an example, here are our tarsiers. They are very small. They're just two to six ounces. Um, and they are the only entirely carnivorous primate. Every other primate that um, eats insects also supplements their diet through something else, whether it's fruit, sap, or leaves. Um, and you can see uh, this guy in the middle loves his grasshopper. And there you can see their super long legs right before they land to catch that grasshopper. But more than just eating, we also need to be able to get our food. So let's talk about a couple of different foraging strategies. One thing to consider is the, your activity budget. How do you allocate your time? Um, so a howler monkey, they actually spend a lot of time resting. 
howler monkeys eat leaves, so they actually do need that amount of time to sit and digest. And Wakari, they have a very different type of activity budget. They spend a lot of time traveling. So these guys eat a lot of nuts, so they need to find them in the first place. The howler monkey, they don't need to spend that much time traveling because leaves are already pretty much everywhere. We can also think about different activity patterns. We have nocturnal, so you're active during the night, diurnal, active during the day, and these two other kind of specialized ones, crepuscular and cathemeral. Um, nocturnal primates, it's harder for them to communicate with each other, um, but there, aren't as, there isn't as much food competition at night. Um, if you are diurnal, you can see better, but there's actually um, decreased levels in olfaction. So there are benefits and cons to different types of activity patterns here. But let's look at some examples. So here, we are comparing a Siaman, a crab-eating macaque, and a dusky leaf monkey. So they all do slightly different things. Um, so our Siaman here, you can see they spend the morning calling. Remember, they are territorial. Um, but they also spend a lot of time feeding. Um, our dusky leaf monkey, they uh, out of these three examples, they spend more time resting than the others. Because remember, they are leaf eaters. They need that time to sit and digest. Um, so when we're foraging, there's a couple different measures we use to characterize different species. The first is day range. It's how far does an individual or population move in a single day. Second, it's the home range. That's the total area. So theoretically, what you do is you just watch a group of primates for a while, and you calculate a lot of individual day ranges, and then you just overlay them on each other, and now you have the home range, or the sum total of everywhere they go. Um, you can also have a core area. So that's the home range that you use a lot. Um, and the territory, that's the area that you actively defend if the species is territorial. So let's put this on a map. Here is a day range. So we have watched one primate for one day, and it has traveled from this tree across a river to this other tree. Now, if we watch this primate for a long time, we would get a map that looks something like this. And you can see, all of it is the home range, but there's this part in the middle that they use a lot, um, outlined by the dotted line, or sorry, the dots, and that we would call their core area. So, what does your favorite primate eat? Do you know their activity pattern? How does their diet affect the rest of their species traits?